the first thing to say is, well, what, what is a startup? Um, and it's, it's quite something different than creating a new business. You know, there, there's opening a new Starbucks or a la franchisee or a bar or a corner cafe, or uh, here we're in Chile, so people have all these salmon farms all over the place, or a winery, and those are, are known things. You're, you're starting a new business but you're not operating under extreme uncertainty. A startup is creating a new institution under extreme uncertainty. You don't know much of what it is. And your goal, your job, is to figure it out. Now, it turns out that operating under extreme uncertainty is something that sort of has us trying to figure it out. You play a 1,000 roles. You wear a 1,000 hats. You try and figure it out. You can't possibly teach someone how to be an entrepreneur. You can give them tips and advice and mentoring, but the truth of the matter is you, you can't learn enough. Um, so I, I keep asking people, well, why are we doing this? You know, why do we spend time not seeing our kids? Why do we spend all this time working on this company? Why are we waking up at 4 a.m. wondering how you're going to close that round of investment, the fact that your, your burn rate's going to run out of money or you're not going to make payroll? And the obvious answer is people think it's about the money. But it turns out startups, especially being an entrepreneur, is a terrible way to make money. Because you fail a lot. I've done eight startups, and most of them failed. Most of the time, I ended up broke. And you take a lot of risk. You, know, you mortgage this house. My last company, I had over $50,000 in credit card debt at some point because I couldn't get a bridge loan. Um, and it ended up being okay. I, so I paid off the credit card debt, sold the company. I'm quite happy with it. But it's tremendously risky. Like, this is not a good way to make money. A good way to make money is to be a partner at a law firm. Go to an investment banking. Inherit it. There's lots of good ways to make money, but startups aren't actually them. Even though, in the space of startups, you have things that have made more money than anything else. The reason I dropped out of my physics degree uh, at 20 and uh, started a company was that I didn't need to ask anyone for permission. There, there's all these instructions, these investors and, and myself, everyone else are giving people advice about what you should be doing and how and what it should be. But the truth of the matter is, when you are the founder of an organization, founder of a company, you no longer need to ask for permission. It's very simple. You need to make more money than you spend. You need to be able to get people who will work with you together in that company. You need to convince investors to invest in you or people to pay you so you do it. And as much as there are the wires and the investors and the funds and everything else, there's no permission needed to start a company. You don't have to get into Startup Chile to start a company in Chile. You don't have to get anyone to say that you have a good idea. And in fact, everyone will say you have a terrible idea. You know, I, I, uh, I, I've had these experiences where I see people attempt to get validation and permission. I had a friend who had a startup uh, that served the university student sector. And he was based in Boston, and he'd received some VC funding, and he'd been around for a few years. And this guy came from Mark from Facebook came over to him and said that he had this Facebook thing that he wanted to sell. And my friend Amit said, oh, I don't know. It's kind of a silly idea. And, and Mark Zuckerberg's like, I want a million dollars for it. And my friend Amit says, oh, no, the Facebook's no, not worth a million dollars. And turns out that everybody is better off for the fact that Zuckerberg wasn't able to sell his thing. Every other big company that you see that came out of Silicon Valley had the same thing. They attempted to sell it. They attempted to sell other people on it, trying to convince them it was a good idea. And no one would accept it. No one thought it was a good idea. There's, there's no rules. There's no one way you have to do it. There's no one way to do it. There's lots of advice. There's lots of patterns to follow. But there's no specific rule. Well, you have to not do illegal stuff. But how you structure your office and how you make your teams work and how you make money, who you put in positions, all those things, those are things you get to invent. 
because you're, you're creating a new institution and you're doing it under tremendous uncertainty. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know how to do it. You can ask for advice, and that's really useful, but you really don't know. Because, because you don't know, because you're creating new things, basically, they're a bad investment because they almost all fail. Very few startups get to the point of having VC funding, and then 85% of those fail. <laughs> now, it takes you several years of your life to do a startup. If it's successful, it's going to take you 10 years for, before you really know it's successful. In your career, you don't get to roll the dice very often. These rare successes are the ones you hear about. You know, everyone talks about Silicon Valley. They talk about the fact of how many companies there are. Silicon Valley produces a billion dollar company every three months, but it's not your company. <laughs> you know, the, the chances of it you being your company, there's, there's 5,000 other companies that were founded those three months, and we only hear about the successes. So the question is, why are we doing this? It's going to take up your life. It's going to ruin your relationships. You're going to dream about making lots of money, and probably not. The, the reason you do it on some fundamental level is you want to make an impact. You want to change the world. The reason you go through the trouble of creating a new institution is you want to change the world. You want to create something new. You want to be able to define the rules by which you work because you think you can make an institution, an organization, a company that can do things better. Or because you're really bad at following other people's rules and you keep getting fired. So to create an institution is a process by which no one can teach. No one can figure it out. You have to learn it. And that's why it's really rare that people can successfully found companies. And it's really rare that those people who can do the early stage of the companies can take it all the way. Because what makes you a successful person when there's two of you in a cafe isn't often the same skills that have you run a 10,000 person organization. So we do it because we want to make things better. Because we have this idea that making a business, making an organization, will change the way the world works and make it a better world. If we didn't want to make the world a better place, if we didn't want to change the world, then we wouldn't do a startup. We do another kind of business. We do a business that had a fair amount of certainty. If you want to make money here in Chile, you go and you get an investor and you set up those nets they down have in southern Chile with all those salmon. And you go get someone from the university who has a degree in salmon farming, and you invest in it. Because you know who's going to sell it, who's going to buy it, how the business works. It's just a matter of, of being an operator and running it. It's what you get when you get an MBA. An MBA teaches you how to administer a business. But it doesn't teach you how to create one. We need a lot of people who can run businesses and administer them. That's an important role in society. But it's not what you people who are trying to found new startups are doing. So when I talk about startups, I'm really talking about technology startups. The companies I heard here were, were various ways of tech startups. And when, uh, when I dropped out of school, got my first angel investment, had the company, we had a VC that was advising us, and it was really nice. And I, I started thinking one night, and I thought, where, where does this money come from? Now, some of you might have thought of this. Like, why am I getting money to do this? My, my first startup was an events calendaring startup. Uh, eventually, we sold it to Palm. But what I realized is what we're doing is restructuring the economy. We're taking parts of the economy, tearing it apart, and rebuilding it. And Sometimes it's called creative disruption, you know, tech crunch disrupt, everything else like that. But really, on, on some level, we're destroying parts of the economy. And this is the, the thing that 
maybe isn't told when uh, there's things like, you know, Startup Canada, Startup Chile, all these other things. We're going to rebuild everything else. But part of what we're doing in new businesses is looking at old parts of the economy, destroying them, because that's, that's what we're doing, because otherwise there wouldn't be wealth, rebuilding them in a way that is quite different. And the way we're doing it, the thing we've seen in this revolution of software is we're, we're doing this tech change through software. Software lets us make it faster, cheaper, and more flexible. It means that we've taken things that were hardened into bureaucratic processes or machines, and we're making them super flexible so you can experiment. So you can A-B test your marketing instead of just printing out one and hoping that your flyer was the right thing. That you can rethink things, you can test them. There's a Mark Anderson who did Netscape and now he's part of Anderson Horowitz, is a very well-known VC these days, said that software is eating the world. And that is the most important concept, I think, when you think about startups and what we're doing. We're building institutions that go out and replace physical or bureaucratic human processes with software. And we're making new things possible and new forms of the economy work because we're doing that. That is sort of if the underlying sort of revolution that's going on. We're rebuilding how, how society works. We're rebuilding how you interact with government. We're rebuilding how you interact with other people. We're rebuilding how you find lovers. We're rebuilding how you work, where you work from, how trade happens. And we're doing that through software. And so we're unlocking a set way the economy used to work and opening up the doors to create new wealth and new ways of doing things, reintegrate the world. We're basically rebuilding how everything works. And it's a, a long, slow process. Even though it feels fast, it's actually a long process. And it's going to take a long time. And so it's not like the startup revolution is done. We have a lot of parts of the economy to change and rebuild. And that's, that's really where the money comes from. We're creating new economic institutions, new ways of doing things. You know, Skype makes money because it takes money away from the old way in which you made international phone calls. It costs much less to run Skype than it does to run a telephone company. So they make a lot less money, but it costs them a lot less. They're a lot more flexible. And so we are essentially extracting out and removing inefficiencies in parts of the economy that let people do other things. Now there's a fear, perhaps rightly, that we may extract all of the jobs out of the economy. And then we would have a problem. We'd have an economy that didn't need workers. And that, that actually is a social problem that not today, but some point decades in the future, we're going to have to address. That we have a perfectly productive economy that doesn't have people working in it, or except for you know, some programmers and designers. So, so what? So what's the point? Why are we doing this? We're not just building businesses. We're not just creating new businesses so that you can make money or return on an investor. I do a little bit of investing. I like to see the companies make money. I'm probably going to lose all my money on my investments. <laughs> For me, it really is a hobby. <laughs> um, but when I think about what we're doing in the broader world, I think that, that we're remaking the world. And I, I want to tell a few stories about some, some startups some of which I'm, I'm friends with, and I have friends with the founders, and some of which I don't know very well. But some startups that are remaking the world and remaking how power works and how the economy works in ways you might not expect. So the first one is a, a friend of mine, Jack Dorsey. Jack uh, was the first CEO at Twitter, and then he got fired and finally learned to be a good manager. He was fired for good reason, because um, he didn't know what he was doing. And he learned how to do it. He started Square, and he was a much better manager the second time. Um, and uh, Square is a payment processing thing. It's got really good UX. You plug it in your iPhone. I, they don't have it here, I don't think. Um, but uh, one of the things Jack realized in running Square was 
they had all the banking information, all the transaction information of all these small businesses. They knew all their costs. They knew how the businesses worked. And so one day they said, what if we disrupted the process of small business loans? What if in your Square app it just said, I want to borrow money to expand my business? And they did this in the US. There's a cafe in New York, and they wanted to open a new cafe. And Square knew exactly how much money they were spending. So Square said, put a button that says, borrow $500,000. And the people at the cafe said, yes. They borrowed $500,000. And $500,000 was deposited in their bank account. That was it. No going into a bank, no putting on a suit, everything else. They had all the transaction. They had all the information they needed. So that cafe went and leased a space and opened a new cafe and expanded. It's the kind of disruption that's possible when a business rethinks and re-intermediates how software happens and how the software restructures the economy. Now, Square never started out to be a bank to do small business loans. But they eventually discovered that's what they could do. Another you can see is uh, TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor is used here in Latin America. And it's restructured the power balance between tourists and hotels and the tourism industry providers. And so all of a sudden, the individual tourist who had no power to complain except writing a letter of complaint or maybe going to the Better Business Bureau has the ability to complain online and actually affect the business. And so it's forced businesses to be on a more equal playing field. Now, mo most hotels and other providers, they actually hate this because they feel like they're at the mercy of a few people who are complaining. But it restructured the power balance. It changed society. Another is uh, Twitter. Um, Twitter was intended as a sort of way to keep up to date with your friends, what was going on, things that weren't important enough to tell other people. And it ended up being useful for changing the media, changing how people got news, how they created news, how they shared ideas. It was much more successful at changing the world and the perception than being a successful business. That took like a decade. Um, another is you see things like OLX or Craigslist, businesses that just took one part of another segment, newspapers classifieds, they destroyed the newspaper's business, but created a separate communities, thousands and thousands of communities that have been vital and growing. And so sometimes, I mean, I mean, Craigslist didn't intend to destroy the newspaper industry, but it happened. Because the newspaper industry was set up in this weird way of they thought they were providing news and what they were really providing was distribution of paper and classifieds. What, one of the things that's been particularly interesting to me for the last few years is this, uh, this concept of civic technology. This sort of idea that the same revolutions we're applying in, so in startups and in business can be applied to the public sector. This idea that if we're going to remake the economy, if we're going to remake society with software, what happens to, to government? What happens to civil society? You know, what happens to the, the, the civil sector? What happens when we rethink what these organizations are and what their roles, roles are? And the, sort of the people who've been doing this for a while are a number of organizations, NGOs, nonprofits, and they're sort of outsiders. And for a long time, there was these different startups. Startups, but they were nonprofits. And they were trying to sort of make the promise of democracy real, the promise of participation. And they were using software, software development, startup techniques, things like that. And they were creating things for you know, freedom of information requests, that kind of stuff, changing what gets built changing how it gets built. These are the same things that we're doing in software. We're changing how startups do things. Changing who pays for software. Is it open source? Is it collaboratively done? Is the government paying for it? Is, is our organizations, businesses being able to do this? And if we do that, do we then get to change the power dynamics? Then we didn't get to change who gets power. 
Do we get to change power dynamics the way Square provides small business loans because they know of your point of sale transaction? There's nothing that made Square could do that that any bank here in Latin America couldn't have done. They had the point of sale things in credit cards. They just didn't rethink of what if we decided in software who should get loans. And they, they came up with this idea of we should make participation as easy as X, as easy as Google, as e easy as Facebook and Twitter. Interacting with your government, interacting with your community should be that easy. And they said this idea of all this stuff should be easy, it should be shifted. And software, as it's gotten easier, it used to be in the, the 80s you needed much, much more money in the 90s than you need now. You know, um, Flickr was a startup started in 2003, photo sharing site. They raised about $5 million and they had about 20 people. And they sold it for $35 million. Five years later, Instagram has 13 people, work for a year, and sell it for a billion dollars. Like, in that time, the size of the team got cut in half, and the amount of time it took got cut in half. And since then, it's shrunk even more. So we can do much more. A single programmer, a single designer, a single product person is more powerful. And we've seen that in the civic sector. There's a group in the UK called My Society that let you complain about your street corners and write letters to your public officials. The United States had an organization called the Sunlight Foundation that did the same thing. In Europe, there's the Open Knowledge Foundation. These are all groups saying, OK, let's apply startup methodology to public participation. In Uruguay, there's an organization called Data that does the same thing. Here in Chile, some of you may know Ciudadano Inteligente, rates politicians and what their, what their views are, everything else. And so these all NGOs have been sort of futzing around saying you should do this for a while. And then something really interesting happened. In the UK, they launched something called GDS. And the GDS project is to apply startup methodology to how the UK builds software. And in the first year, they saved 500 million pounds by canceling dumb software projects and building things that work. The US just launched something called, very cryptically, 18F. I think it's the name of the room where the, the project started, which is an attempt to do the same thing. And it's an attempt to say that we should force government to act like startups that do software and technology. We should make those services like that. We should make them experimental, willing to fail, doing small things, and learning quickly. We should make it so restructuring the government it's like restructuring the economy. Because what we're doing in software is restructuring the economy and society. And it works. It's not perfect. But it does work for being more innovative more quickly. And we can apply that to other sectors. So I ask you, as you're doing startups, I know you're really busy. I know you're looking for funding. I know there's 10,000 things to learn and do. I've done it myself. I've had eight startups. Five were complete failures. Two had modest exits. And I had one home run, which I quit before I got the bonus of it. Um, and, uh, but even then, even after you remember all that busy stuff, remember that you're reshaping the world. Remember the effect you're having. And think about the decisions you're doing, because you're creating institutions that reshape it. And as we reshape it, I have to ask you, you know, what kind of world do we want? How do we want these things to do? You know, all this investment in clean tech, it's not just because there's money. It's also because we don't want the sea levels to rise 20 meters. We don't want to deal with, in 100 years, a billion people displaced along the coasts. Like, it's about making money. It's about how you turn it, but it also is about what kind of society we want how we want that participation to happen. And so it's important to realize that you're restructuring, you're redesigning society in a way that very few people get to do. Politicians know they're doing this. That's why they're politicians. They get elected. But individuals, people who are startups, 
where entrepreneurs, they sometimes forget that they have the power to transform society too. And so it's important to remember that and push society in the direction we want to have it. Um, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. You've talked about um, uh, how so our technology is disrupting uh, the economy, and you've talked about the government. And uh, what were, would be your thoughts on how the disruption could affect the home, the actual home itself? The home is in the, the house or the family life? Um, I mean, there, so there's, there's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that we're looking at a, a situation where people's, people's lives are transformed. This, this idea of always being connected and rethought, th those, are, those are very new things. In the United States, it used to be a rite of passage in Canada too, North America. When you turned 16, you got your driver's license because that's how you met your friends, and that's how you got out. And it was the dream of everyone to get a car, even if it was a crappy car. You were cool if you had the car and you could drive your friends around. North American teenagers no longer get their driver's licenses. It's not that they can't afford it. They put it off. They get it in their late teens. They get it in their late 20s. They get it when they get around to it. But it's not the most desperate thing you dream of. And that's because teenagers connect to their friends virtually. They can figure out where they are, how to connect, and maintain those social connections of their lives without physically traveling back and forth. And so that sort of transformed the family life, the home, more than we even understand. Like we're just seeing the first indications of, oh, teenagers don't want driver's licenses. It'll take us another generation until the kids who grew up from their very first day being online, those, those people are going to use computers differently. They're going to use technology differently. It's not going to be this new thing that gets introduced. Uh, would you say there's a singular reason why uh, your five startups failed? Or were they all different? Did everyone fail differently, or how did that work? A singular reason why they so there's a a successful startup seems even if you had to pivot and you ran out of money and then you found like even if you had like a thousand even if like it feels like you failed or got near failure over and over again there's always the path that led you to success but there's a thousand reasons why it could fail and you never know like like there are so many ways to fail you could do 999 of those things right and that damn extra thing failed. And so, no, I don't think there was like one particular thing that made it fail. I, I think I made a lot of mistakes. I chose some bad co-founders. Uh, I, I had a, a startup that failed because we stayed in Boston and we should have moved to San Francisco. Um, and we were flying out to make business deals and that meant that our competitors got acquired and not us. I had startups that failed because we didn't get commitments. People did it as like a part-time thing and they didn't do it, you know. And, and then I've had ones that failed and you don't even know why. Yeah. I know failure is where we learn, but what, it, what was maybe one or two successes that you've come along the way the process? So, I mean, the, the success that I, I, you know, I learned the most from was a startup Odeo, podcasting startup, 
didn't work. We got crushed by Apple. We did hackathons, pivoted, um, launched two products. One I'm sure you've heard of called Helodio. The other one no one uses called Twitter. Um, we weren't sure whether Helodio or Twitter would be the more successful product. Um, no one knew. Um, I think the, the lesson was don't pay attention to the press. Don't pay attention to the vanity metrics. It really doesn't matter that 50,000 people signed up for your beta program if they aren't actually using it. At Odeo, we launched it uh, on the stage of TED and at the New York Times at the same time. It was this, you know, we had been in stealth mode and we came out and everybody said this is beautiful and fantastic. And we got tons of praise and no one used the damn product. Our usability sucked. It was beautiful, but we didn't get the user flow right and we missed things. Um, with the way Twitter was launched, is no one wanted anyone to know what it was working on. It was a secret side project that we didn't want anyone to know about. And the success of did it work or didn't it work was driven by engagement. We had uh, 100 users of Twitter in the first couple months. And those people sent or received 100,000 messages a month. The average early adopter was spending hundreds of dollars a month on SMS overage, overage fees. Now, Twitter or Odeo, the company, didn't make any money from that. But it meant that a few people really, really cared. And if I learned one thing, it's, it's better to be loved and hated than to be sort of in the middle. Now, I personally, even though I was the first employee, lead developer, ran the engineering team, didn't realize that Twitter would be a success. Three months after it was launched, I thought it was a dumb idea, and I quit and sold all my stock. <laughs> um, but that, I mean, what I learned and why I got into doing lean startup stuff is that 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 engagement of those 100 people who didn't think it was dumb and really used it, that's the signal you want. Page views, sign-ups, awards, uh, all those things, those don't count. They don't mean anything. But real engagement and use and something someone will pay for, even if they're not paying you, is what counts. Because eventually you can figure out how to get them to pay you. One more question? Oh. You were awesome. Thanks.